In the democratic model in Pakistan, given that it has continuously produced uh, leadership drawn from a very few vested minority political family and power factions, uh, which is inherently uh, historically shown in Pakistan, just produced one corrupt government after another. Yours is an extremely loaded question with a lot of assumptions. <laughs> leaving aside whether I agree with him or not. When it comes to a matter of faith, it's a matter of religion. Matters of constitution are not matters of faith. You have to abide by them, whether you like them or not. You live in England, you follow the law here. You live in Pakistan, you should follow the law there. Now, if, and taking the thing without commenting upon what you assume, which may or may not be true, you have a better option. We've seen the options we've had. Did corruption go down? I mean, say yes, it did go down under military dictatorships. Then, okay, fine, you were justified. But merely making assumptions and just denigrating the constitution of Pakistan and putting yourself over and above what the people of Pakistan, mm -hmm. the people of Pakistan without slippers, without education, maybe dirty, maybe filthy, maybe you don't like them, maybe I don't like them, but they have decided how to govern themselves and that is by the constitution of Pakistan. So we must all obey the constitution of Pakistan. These sort of questions, diaspora usually asks, why don't they question the governance in UK or America or Germany where they live? There they very happily accept the governance systems. Let us be governed by what we have chosen to be governed by. Let us, let, it, let some time pass. And today we are where we are. So where is our journey? Where has our destination been? The country comprises not of land, it comprises of people. We lost half the country. Why? Question that. Was it because of corrupt politicians? No. It was because of power hungry general that you lost the country. As simple as that. You did not re respect the people's will. I'm sorry if I don't want to come across as rude, but I feel very, I'm very clear about this in my mind. I mean, Article 5 says every Pakistani, wherever he may be, if you're a Pakistan, then the constitution of Pakistan is bound, you're bound by it. On us, uh, people like presidents, prime ministers, MPAs, MLAs, army officers, judges included, we have taken on the added response. My name is Asim and uh, I am a dissident Pakistani blogger who was abducted in 2017 and defended by Asma Jangir and now I'm living in exile here in the UK. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Asif Skopadi. Um I'm an engineer and keen, uh, take keen interest in Pakistan political affairs and I do have an alternate uh, model in mind. For Pakistan. This is for, <laughs> this might be kept to make for the third Asma Jangir lecture. <laughs> Asim, who does not tell us his surname, uh, Asif, Asim Saeed. As far as that was a commission, there was not a case, and I was directed. Then I was a, then I was a judge of a high court, uh, and there were two other judges of high courts, and the commission which you refer to as the memo commission was constituted. We were given a task, and if you've read the memo commission report. It had exonerated and the allegation made, I won't name the persons, the, the what you referred to and uh, that may be difficult for you to accept was when an ambassador of Pakistan who is paid by the people of Pakistan gave an undertaking in the Supreme Court to come to Pakistan, he violated the undertaking of Pakistan. I think it's a serious matter. We, we, what do you mean? I have never heard. We, we were repeatedly calling him, please come, please come, and please come. Now, you, a normal person, you may be a dissident and elect to live here, but if you're a paid employee of the state, the people pay for you then, and particularly if you added on, given an undertaking to the Supreme Court of Pakistan that you'll come whenever called and don't do so, then I don't know. Then we don't have rule of law at all anywhere in the world. So 
uh, that's my answer. You may have your views on the matter, but uh, that's how it is. The question is about what is the role of judiciary in upholding the democratic rights and processes in areas which do not even have the constitutional rights in Pakistan besides being 70 years and more. Thank you. Uh, actually, Iram from, is from Gilgit, Baldistan, uh, acronym GB. <laughs> And it is uh, the territories of Pakistan are uh, defined in the constitution comprising of the four provinces of the Islamabad capital territory. And Gilgit Baltistan, unfortunately, is not that part of the territory of Pakistan. It, yes, I know what you mean. I don't have the answer. It's extremely complicated and it will be, probably you can have another whole seminar on this subject because it depends on treaties, uh, our position on Kashmir, etc., etc. I don't have jurisdiction in your territory, as simple as that. That's what the constitution is. If you amend the constitution, then <laughs> give us uh, jurisdiction, like like any other territory. It's it's considered. It's not mentioned in the constitution of Pakistan. It is a it's a very complicated thing, more political than legal. Rishi has been subservient to those dictators, starting from not only just the Bizuddin Khan, those and all that. And we need to understand for everyone, they say that in Asma Jilani case, the verdict was delivered after Yahya Khan was born. And then we go on to Justice Hassan Khan and Justice Marulak, and still the judgment in 2012, this Hussain uh, Khani, because that was a, honestly civil, civilian supremacy versus martial law. And the last question would be, what about the disappearance of Balochistan people still. Whether it was Balochistan High Court, when you were the Chief Justice, and now, nothing has been done. Who is stopping us from doing it? Please, sorry about that. I think I myself pointed out where the judiciary's role has been, uh, for want of a better phrase, has been much to be desired with, and where it has Judiciary is not a monolith, it's not a building, it's not an ins it's it's individuals make up the judiciary. Yes, there are judges who have left a mark which makes me proud to be part of the judiciary and then yes, there have been judges who have done otherwise and I mentioned the chief court of sin, that those are also five judges of the, the chief court of sin and what happened in the supreme court and then again we have judges like Justice Jawad Khaja, the 14-member bench. So yes, it's it's been a mixed bag. I, I completely agree with you there. As far as the case of missing persons is concerned, I was, uh, I became Chief Justice of Balochistan uh, in 2009. And uh, I mean, I don't want to say it because it may sound like a bit of a boast, but uh, you're right, missing person cases would not be fixed in court. And uh, that changed and I designated a particular day, which was incidentally Tuesday, when missing person petitions were fixed. And previously what would happen was the case would be adjourned and no missing person case was ever adjourned, a fixed date was given. And the reason why we chose Tuesday was because, for, for that matter, it just happened to be Tuesday, is because we would call all the concern that would be the the home secretary on that day that would be representative of the frontier con, uh, core not constabulary that would be the deputy attorney general that would be the advocate general and all others so each officer we didn't want to waste that they should be sitting there in every day and the position there was uh, uh, pretty tough uh, the first province in which the local government elections were held was in Balochistan and I was told that this, this is law and order situation. My name is Halima Hijazi and I'm a student here. Uh, so my question is that how I see the Supreme Court, currently the Chief Justice has a lot of powers. He can predetermine the outcome of a case by just composing a bench in a certain way, by keeping certain judges on the bench and by preventing the others <laughs> from becoming the member. Um, so my question is, will Justice Isa as Chief Justice be, be you know, encouraging some reforms in this sector? And also, he also almost became victim of this. 
um, not once but twice, <laughs> once initially when the uh, two judges who, had, who could have benefited from uh, him getting uh, you know, removed from the Supreme Court uh, were made part of the match and also when the judges who were sympathetic to his position were removed from the review petition stage. Thank you. Uh, reform, where do we start? I think the constitution, if we just abide by the constitution, we really don't need any reforms. For instance, there was criticism of, uh, you made the point about Sumoto jurisdiction criticism. I think most of the times we don't read the constitution. 184.3 says that a matter of public importance for the enforcement of fundamental rights, for the enforcement of fundamental rights. Now, if you're not going to read those words and assume powers which you don't have, then uh, I will agree with Sulema, 100%. But I have also assumed powers under 194.3, but every time I've done so, I've at least highlighted what was uh, the matter, of, that it was a matter of public interest. And matter of public interest means it does not involve only Alima Ijazi's rights, but if it's a representative and the other thing is, it must be the enforcement of a fundamental right. I'll give you an example where uh, exercising Sumoto powers loss was caused to the National Exchequer. And that was, uh, I won't name judges' names, but that was a, a tax imposed on uh, mobile phones and a certain amount gets deducted at source. So when you buy whatever 100 rupees, you get like 80 rupees or whatever and the rest goes into various taxes and that was that was suspended by the supreme court and initially and then when i came on the bench uh so it was a three member bench and i said which fundamental right is being violated which fundamental right guarantees you not to be taxed that doesn't mean that a tax is correct you can then challenge it through the regular mechanism where you challenge your tax but you cannot do so under 184.3. So if we don't, I'm, I'm, I would consider myself a conservative judge. If you abide by the constitution and the laws, you don't, you're okay. When you start diverging and you start uh, inventing, inventing, uh, I mean, it's one thing interpreting in a manner which advances the relief. It's another thing inventing something which does not exist this case in hand where there was there is no fund enforcement of fundamental right and uh, something has been done and there are other uh, cases as well which I would rather not go into but I think as a student of law you may have studied uh, so <laughs> reforms is if I'm there if you give me suggestions and please criticize me as much as possible uh, I have no problem with that I think a healthy society criticism is good as long it's uh, it's meaningful, I mean, it's really I'm Islamabad and I'm doing my LLM at Queen Mary. I just wanted to ask, uh, in your judgment on the Fazabad Dharna, you wrote about the borderline sympathetic coverage of the TLP, the Hrikat of Beit Pakistan. I just wanted to ask you, how should the government strike a fine balance between guaranteeing our rights to free speech as Pakistanis versus restricting the spread of hateful content? particularly in a country like ours that is religious and where religion is not a private matter but a public one. I don't want to comment too much about that case because there is a review, there are many reviews pending. I can talk about generalities. The constitution guarantees uh, freedom of expression in article 19. But it also, I mean, for instance, if you advocate murdering someone, that is not freedom of speech in our law, maybe in some other jurisdiction you can say that but not in Pakistan if I was to say murder uh, let's smile smile is not a nice person so that cannot be done in Pakistani law uh, under the constitution as well as the law so I would not want to go into the details of that case but I don't know if you endorse the view or not that is for you and for history to judge uh, but when we bring in religion, I think the religion of Islam, which we keep forgetting, is a very peaceful religion. And it has been painted horrifically by people who are, I don't think are serving Islam in the least. It is, it is 
the, the, the very the word islam is peace submission i mean why how do we greet each other assalamu alaikum i mean and walikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh it sort of added on i mean how why don't we gauge the conduct of the prophet if you are going to stand up in his name then why don't we emulate his example there was what did he suffer uh, how he suffered that story of the woman who would abuse him and throw filth and garbage at him one day she didn't and he went to inquire about her what's wrong with her she was ill and she converted so this is a religion of beauty and peace and uh, so we are somehow scared when we use the word religious and i think the word religious should be used in a good way as opposed to in okay this is religious i better not touch it why not uh, this you are living in the islamic republic of pakistan where the constitution preamble opens by say, saying sovereignty belongs to almighty allah and to be exercised through his chosen representatives